so we present two papers today. So the first one is the neural descriptor fields paper. And then the, the second one is the vector neuron paper and Karan will present the second one, the vector neurons. And then we start with this one. So I start with the, the neural descriptor fields. So that's the paper I shared on Monday. Just put in a different mode. It's and interesting so, that paper actually refers to this to the second paper you're going to present too. Yes, yeah. So the, these authors here they cite the second uh, paper and they use the vector neurons. And I'm going to tell you where they exactly use them. And also, I just display this here. It's interesting from where the authors are from. You see a mix of MIT, Google, and University of Toronto. So to start with, I'd like to show you what the system can do, the demonstration. So that's just, uh, the actually pre pre We present neural descriptor fields, an SE3 equivariant object representation or robotic manipulation. Suppose a robot is provided with a demonstration of grasping an upright mug and hanging it on a rack. We propose a system that can use just a small handful of these demonstrations to repeat the task on a new mug, which has a different shape and is placed in a never before seen pose. More generally, our goal. Okay, I just wanna show you how, how the other system works. And this is a rather lengthy video, more than 13 minutes. And so, yeah, if you like to see it, it's, it's on, their, on their website. They did a, a good job with this video explaining the thing. So, so how did they do this? How did they achieve that they can pick up cups in various poses and then being able to hang it on that hanger with a robot arm? And the first thing what they do is they describe uh, an object and it's something used uh, achieved with deep learning that they can um, get like this continuous function of the object where they map a point in 3D onto an occupancy map. So whether, which means, so this is the, uh, the capital Phi here. If it's one, it's inside the object or inside the point cloud. If it's zero, it's outside. And they essentially train the deep net to do this mapping. And then for example, if, if you do things like that and that they leverage previous work, so that's not, that part is not the original work. And, and this is also a figure from one of the previous works that they cite in the paper. And so for example, once you get this mapping, you can get a, a really continuous function of the surface of the object, the killer bunny. And here, so you, you, so you learn a continuous representation of what's inside and what's outside. You could also interpret this as a probability of being inside or outside. Because but the function you learn will be continuous. But Heiko, here uh, the it looks like they're training it for a specific pose. Is that right? Um, yeah, yeah. Typically, if you start to train this a specific pose, yeah. Um, so yeah, let, maybe let's talk about this for for a bit. So how do they actually do that? Um, so so they they use a function. The phi is the function of the x. So x is the point in the space here, 3D point. And then they use uh, a latent representation of the point cloud. And, and this, this they use um, uh, the leverage prior work, which is called the point net. And the point net maps those point cloud onto some classes. And in between, you have some latent representation which is for a specific pose. So think about it as a sort of like a coarse grained post specific representation of the point cloud. And this is in some k-dimensional space. So it, here, um, are, is this set P, the point cloud P, is that include all of the points in this uh, object that they have access to? Yeah, so this could be, for example, if it's the bunny or the cup, the, the point cloud of the cup. Okay. Um, the, the way they trained it, this function, they actually use partial point clouds, like from one view. 
and then but then using the whole model of the entire object train this function okay so it, this function would be trained on lots of objects or just one object the um yeah, that's a good question. So yeah, I'm, I'm trying to figure out why we need, if it's just on one object, why do you need phi? Do you have the point cloud and just interpolate and see whether it's in or out? The, well, the, the, this function here, the, this, this was trained a priori on a whole bunch of objects. Okay, okay. And this, so, way yeah. a, this way you get a latent representation. Okay, so given any point cloud, it will give you like some smooth surface. Yeah, describing it. Okay, okay. And and then, but then you have some some latent representation, which just depends on the pose. Yeah, yeah. And then obviously the X is for a specific pose too. Uh, but if you had the bunny in a different pose, you could give it that point cloud, and it would still work. Yeah, if the bunny is yeah. a different pose, then the latent representation is different. Yes. And the right. X is different, but then what they do is they, they combine those two, right? The latent representation and the X in another network. So this is the capital phi. And this network is structured according to the vector neurons. Okay. And so, so imagine this produces like a set of vectors in 3D space or some concatenated version of those vectors. And and then and then you, you combine those with with these three D vectors in these vector neurons, uh, vector neural networks. And then so so Karen will talk about that how that can make it like equivariant or invariant to the specific pose, and you still get uh, recognize the object. So so the classification itself, for example, would be invariant to the pose. And here, in this case, the, the occupancy map would be equivariant, so it would rotate correspondingly to the rotation of the object. And, and so, so the, the way they train it, so, so given they have four specific point cloud or object, they can then uh, get this mapping, uh, let, let's say then they presented just this part of the bunny, and this was already pre-trained, so it'll present produce some latent vectors, they combine it with X to this vector neurons, and then they train it um, across the X in the entire space to produce for a particular pose at a time to, to produce this dense mapping. So now once, once the phi is trained, what they want to get? I just ask a quick question, Heiko? I'm sure. I'm not quite following. Um, so this point cloud P is this kind of given at runtime? Like I look at this object from a given angle, and this produces a point cloud, or is it like I have the grand truth point cloud for this object, and then I'm going to look at it from a pose and get this point X? Mm -hmm. so, so the specific latent input is is the current input. But you need to know, but it's specific to the object. You need to know the object you're dealing with. So, so for lots of different examples of X, the point cloud will just be the same. E of P will be the same. Um, yeah, I, I need to check in detail how they, how they train this one. So. So I, I so the way I understand it, so they so they have this mapping at some point, which is they already leverage a pre-trained network. And they have this latent space. And then for a given point cloud or for a given object in a given input P, um, given that you already have this pre-trained network that gives you some output, right? Even if it's a partially complete point cloud P. And and then you can train the phi to get you this occupancy map for all the points in that space. Okay, so yeah, these are really basic questions because I'm not familiar with this line of work really, but so P is gonna be different. Like if I look at the bunny from 
here, or if I look at it from like the you know 30 degrees to the right, I'm gonna get different point clouds and therefore yeah, different then, embeddings. Then it's, then it's a different point cloud, then it's a different embedding. Okay. And, uh, and then but how do you so how exactly so does I think this, this is arise? Yes, I think this is similar to the questions I was asking Ben. So my understanding is this P is you know so you have some ground truth, so you have some point clouds of some object like like we have in habitat. You know, mm -hmm. you have a set of points and as the pose of the rabbit changes in world coordinates, the actual X, Y, Z points are going to change, right? As the rabbit rotates right. and this, this, um, this big epsilon, I don't know what the Greek letter is there. I guess it's epsilon. Yeah, um, it looks like a big epsilon. A big eps, curly epsilon. <laughs> <laughs> um, this one is, a, um, is a network that's trained on point, lots and lots and lots of point clouds. Um, yeah, that's right. A, of different, you know, rabbits and mugs and all sorts yeah. of different poses. And as Heiko was saying, even with partial uh, point clouds. And what this big psi is, is now given some 3D point X, given the point cloud and the representation of the point cloud is X inside the object or outside the object. Mm -hmm. But but right. but the pi has to be your or the p has to be your current what you currently see in the current what you're currently seeing exactly so this this big epsilon thing is is some latent representation that's for all object categories and all poses and partial point clouds and this big psi uh, tells you you know given that latent representation will tell you whether the point is inside or outside that full object yeah exactly yeah. i guess my question is are they sneaking the rabbit into the hat so to speak here no pun intended <laughs> by um by just having like a, a point cloud like a point cloud already is uh tell like a point cloud already defines like if you're on or off the object yeah yeah that's what i was asking yeah you could just do linear interpolation and it kind of tells you but what heiko said it's yeah. actually trained on partial point clouds uh, so it has yeah. to do a little bit more generalization. Yeah, um, yeah. The the way they actually the epsilon. I'm not sure if they train it on partial ones, but anyway, it was already pre-trained. Imagine for any kind of point cloud, it gives you some latent representation. Yeah. No, it but is they, trained on partial. I just read. Uh, it says the full model can be trained end to end on a data set of partial point crowds and corresponding occupancy voxel grids. Yeah. And and so. And then for, for given whatever you see in the current thing, yeah, it's then combined with the X, right? So, you, and, and this combination, you wanna do it in a way that it's uh, equivariant to the rotation. And this is achieved so, through the vector neurons. Combining so X, yeah, Vivian? Is X in the reference frame of the object? No, X is in some world coordinate system. Yeah, it has to be the same coordinate system as P, I think. Yeah, it's the same as P, yeah. So if you rotate the object, the thing will be different. Both, both P and X will rotate, right? But later they're gonna do an object-centric representation with the robot, I think. But here, yeah. so far, it's all in world coordinates. Right. Yeah. So let's say that they have learned this. And so, so, so the capital Phi max, maps onto this occupancy. But then they again want to have some latent representation of the capital Phi. And so they look at the capital Phi for different layers in there. So not just the end output. And, and then they concatenate those values. And, and that's what they do, what they call um, the, the this 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 what they call the neural descriptor or neural descriptor field field because you get the, that value for each point in space. So so this is again the capital phi, and and the the upper index i means this is just using the capital phi uh, vector neural network and has several different uh, layers, at, through a whole bunch of layers you capture what are the, the latent variables and just concatenate all of them. And this concaten concaten concatenation 
of all those uh, latent variables is is the, the neural descriptor field as they describe it. And, and given that this combination of X and P was done with this vector network, it's equivalent to the rotation. And the way this shift is as follows, for example, the, the F value here, um, if there, for example, if there's a peak in that F value uh, on, on the handle, for example, that peak would rotate with the whole cup if you rotate it. So if you rotate your point cloud, so you look, rotate your P and you rotate all the, your X, so they would, should rotate in exactly the same way, which is achieved through this vector neuron vector, vector neuron network. So as for example, to imagine how this could work um, with a vector neuron network, uh, one a very simple operation in there, it's like uh, the vector product, right? So you get the cosine between two vectors. And, and that thing would, that value would rotate with its two vectors, right? So you rotate the cup and the corresponding vectors and you rotate uh, the vector X in space. But by the way, for the whole thing to work, they have to make it relative to some, up to some center. Right? Um, so, so first they, they take the point cloud and they convert it subtracting the, the, the mean of the point cloud. So all the points are relative to the center of the point cloud. And then it's invariant to the rotation. So they, they achieve sort of like displacement vectors, right? They, they achieve um, translation variance by subtracting a common center. So effectively you have a difference between points and then achieve the rotation invariance through this vector neurons. So effectively deal with a whole bunch of cosine angle values. So and, I, have a I have a question about that. So if, yeah. if you're viewing this point cloud from one side, we're only seeing one half of the cup. Mm -hmm. How are you getting a common center there? Because the, the centroid of, of that is actually not the center of the object. It's the center of the partial point clouds or there's going to be a displacement there. Yeah, I had that exact same question. That, that's a good point. I, I didn't <laughs> I didn't notice the solution in the paper. I, uh, yeah. I think they met they they hacked around it or something. I think they ignored that issue. Yeah, yeah, it, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That that's actually a very good issue. Um yeah I didn't see it addressed, but I'm not sure if I missed it, but I didn't see it addressed. Um and yeah it's I, I guess they assume you see enough of the point cloud that is sort of close, right? Center is sort of close, but it, it, yeah, it's, if you see just, let's say you just see the handle, right? Everything else is covered. Well, screw it up for sure. Um, and and those, those kind of, a partially obscured object. Yeah, if it's sufficiently enough obscured, yeah, it depends how much you take away. Maybe part of this minimization process also tries to find the best center. I don't think they mentioned that, but you could um, imagine putting it yeah, part of the. Yeah, what 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 my feel is why it's sort of sort of robust to that thing. It's because at the end of the day, they map. Let's say they're interested in the handle here, right? And then so they map a set of point clouds, like around the handle. They rotate it and translated it, that it matches here, this descriptor field, right? This, imagine this is the color here is like a landscape, this local landscape around the cup. That's essentially what you want to match. And then it, does, it doesn't matter so much that like you get it off somewhere else, right? Yeah. And, and since they, anyway, rotate and translate both this local patch, they optimize it, the, the rotation right. and translation. Um, you probably get around that problem. I think another issue, another thing that's helping them is because they're training with partial point clouds, they will have trained with, so let's say Kevin, in your example, if they're only seeing half of the cup, uh, they will have also trained with a view that's probably just you know, a similar half of the cup. And so they will have trained with that particular translation or mean point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So they, they yeah. are assuming a lot of partial training as well. So it'd be sort of kind of a brute force. That would be right. like a brute force right. deep learning. Right. Well, the, the, the claim that they're making here, yeah. the claim that they're making here, uh, as opposed to the one in the uh, in the uh, uh, vector group, is that they're claiming SE three. Uh, Lee group, which should be trans, uh, should uh, be translation and rotation right. invariant. Right. So, if if they're basically saying, "Hey, we're going to center this thing and eliminate the translation," that's kind of not the same thing. So, there's got to be more. I think yeah, it's the same thing. I think it's that. the same thing. What they're saying is this: it's SE three in uh, equivariant with respect to P. This partial yeah, with respect point cloud, exactly with not respect to the object. To, <laughs> yeah, with respect to this specific P, the yes. sense. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is different from the object. Yeah, this is a good point, uh, Subutai. It, it's with it's just with respect to a specific P, and then formally it's it's strictly translation variant, right? You subtract the center. Um. Yeah. So. And, and then, so so this is how they get how they follow a, a point on the object, right? But how how do you get now a whole set of points? Because you want to you want to get the the rotation of the handle. And and this is done by having uh, not just one point, but a whole set of points in the neighborhood of that one point. And and for each of those, you want to match this descriptor field. So imagine you have a point here and a point here on the handle and you point here on, on the bottom here. So you wanna rotate those three points in a way that this one is green and this one is orange and this one is blue. So that's essentially the map, the mapping they need to do. So you have this error function, which is just, let's say the difference in color between two points you wanna minimize that for a whole set of points. And this way you can imagine like visually, right? For this one here, that there's only a certain rotation where those colors across multiple points will match. And, and, and they show that, so this, this not, doesn't show the rotation yet, but it's just for, um, they, they show based on that uh, demonstration, let's say that your key point should be on the handle and then they recover that key point on the handle across different rotations, but also slight variations of the of the shape. Yeah, I thought that was really cool. Yeah, that, yeah, that, that's pretty cool. And, and and I think that's because yeah, essentially because you focus just on this local region, right? And and the descriptor itself has sort of somehow the way it's colored, it sort of relates to some of the other parts of the object in this way. Yeah. You can rotate with it. This is where the latent representation comes into place. So I think going back to like Vivian's point, now what they have is sort of an object centric representation of that mm -hmm. point on the cup. Yeah. And in a way that's actually generalizes to different cup shapes. So if you have a, like the lower right, you have a fat cup you know, this this point here is a very similar representation to this point here on a very different cup. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's quite neat. And, and they show it for a couple of different objects, for example, the bowl here, and you see the, the bottom of the bowl, despite the different shapes. And then, so, yeah, so, so this relates here to what I mentioned, but how, how do they get this set of points? And they essentially, do it based on the on, on the bounding box around the gripper. So, so you've got your gripper. So this 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 gray thing is the robotic gripper. It's like a linear gripper, opens and closes. And then and when they grip at a certain location, they see what is the bounding box of the the gripper piece here, which is just below the gripper. And based on that, they sample a bunch of points, like this one here. Looks like some random uh don't remember exactly what they did it looks like some gaussian random sampling here and and then they represent the, those two points in terms of the descriptor value and you can for this location you can assign each according to the function f 
a value. And then you just rotate. And what you do in the optimization, you rotate that coordinate system. Okay, uh, on the bottom row, they just visualize yeah, why you want to do it relative to this local area. Because if you don't know the shape of the cup, this bottom area, you would try to grasp it. Let's say your coordinate system rotates relative to the bottom, right? And you couldn't grasp it up there. So it's, it's relative to the thing you, the point you're grasping, and your coordinate system rotates with that. Um, so this is an example of, of this optimization. So they do an optimization of, of the uh, uh, rotation and translation. So this is the full four by four uh, rotation translation matrix uh, applied to, uh, to each point and then applied to the reference frame of this uh, end effector. And then as I mentioned, right, it's rotated until they find the best match regarding the individual neural descriptor field of these individual points. And these, this shows part of the iteration of getting there to that point. So it's sort of like the mental rotation that it takes. It takes a couple of steps to get there. And then how, how do they do this optimization? I don't think I got that far in the paper. They, um, yeah, if, if you imagine the, this optimize, this, this loss function I showed before. Yeah. This, this doesn't show the whole thing just for one point, but but you have this for each point. Yeah. And then you, you let's say you rotate your, let's say this is fixed and you, you want to adjust this one. Then you rotate the, all the X. You put in here your rotation or translation function in here, matrix. And this is all a linear operation, right? And then it goes to the whole network. And since the whole network is um, differentiable, they can compute this error by propagating okay. to the network and then adapt the weights with actually a standard deep learning toolbox okay. using the Atom optimizer. Okay. Okay. Well, that's, that's nice. Yeah, that's neat. I guess symmetric objects that would have a... Have yeah. A yeah. So met, although um, my guess... I guess it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter. It would just pick one point, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just wondering. I was just thinking, if you had a sugar bowl there instead, whether it's it's just going to pick one of the two loops, or whether it's going to get totally confused. I think it'll still I, converge it, to some maximum. Yeah, it should pick one of the two. Because imagine if you think about it in terms of these landscapes, right? If it's uh, if there's a second handle on the other side, it should have this blue field also on the other side. And if you locally match to this blue region, right? You're not, you're not gonna. So this is like a local maximum here in the in the error function. So you're not gonna get stuck here. And so you, you're gonna go to one of the two sides. You, you only get into trouble if there's a local minima that doesn't fit somewhere in between. Um, I'm not sure if it exists with this with this particular case. But yeah, in, in principle, it could be a local minima. But it, it might be simple enough for those kind of cases that they don't occur. But it, yeah, that, that's actually an interesting point, right? Once you even more complex objects on. Yeah, I'm not sure. But it would, at least for those cases, if the two handles, it would converge to one of the two. And if it's like totally symmetric, right, the rim. Uh, you, you want to go to the rim or on the cup, it would pick any any part of the rim. However, since they do their local descriptors, somehow takes into account the, the, the whole shape of the cup through this um, latent representation of the gold point cloud. And, and so in this way, you sort of take into account the distance to the handle here. And this way, even though those locally, those points sort of look like all the same, they're still different in terms of the neural descriptive field, depending how close they are to the handle. So that's that's yeah, why it's taking. I, I guess if 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 I were if I if I were trying to abstract the problem and saying I want to find where the grip points are on this thing, mm -hmm. uh, and it's a cup and it's you know concave in, inside, you know anywhere along the rim would be a grip point. The handle is a grip point. So, 
I mean, I'm seeing in this in this potential function or this energy function or whatever they they were calling it, uh, they've kind of highlighted, you know, the the handle, but there are other grip points on there. And then when they when they illustrate that, when they they take the uh, uh, when they try to train the robot through that, uh, like I'm not seeing, you know either the top or bottom i'm not even sure which is the top and which is well okay obviously it's on, on the left on the uh, main one you can see where the top is yeah. but it wouldn't even it looks like it wouldn't even attempt to go for uh gripping it uh, by the by the top rim so i'm, I'm just I'm, I'm trying to understand whether they're really illustrating a configuration space that I could find multiple potential solutions, whether they somehow stack the deck and say, yeah, we're just going to look for this loop here. Yeah, in, in their case, it's really, the grass point is very specific to the demonstration and it's specific to how, how that location of the grass point is sort of in, in the object centric coordinate system by having a, a relationship to the, the features of the whole object, right? Which includes the handle, everything. So whenever they demonstrate some arbitrary grass point, let's say on, on the cup here, um, everything is, this, this would be in relationship to the sort of overall shape of the whole thing. Yeah. Okay, so they're, uh, they're just trying to re-identify a specific- Yeah, a specific. Conformal grip point that they've seen before and they know how to deal with. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's through demonstration. Okay, so okay. if you put the mug upside down, we'll not know what to do. No. <laughs> No, well, if you demonstrate it first the right way up and say, this is your grip point, and then you turn it around, as long as they didn't get confused. There's, as you see here, right? If there's enough symmetry, then you might not know which way is the right way. So I could imagine error like that, right? But then it's, if, if it's sufficiently anti-symmetric regarding up and down, um, then it should still pick it up the right way around and turn it. But yeah, this, this by the way, that, that's a, a good point. If there's if it's like symmetric like this, the solution it may come up, it might be sometimes the wrong way around. So it would seem like for a robust solution, it would have to have have to have more. I mean, you could train it for the you know the couple of grip points on, on the thing, but if, the, if if there's not sufficient notion of of you know where uh, what's concave and what's convex on the object, as, as you say, it might not have sufficient, you know, wherewithal to to know the exact. I mean, it could ram the bottom through the uh, through the. Uh... Anyway, I I, 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 I I get the point that, that this is demonstrating a specific right. uh, pose translation and variant way of finding a particular feature mm -hmm. uh, robustly on, on, on the object. Uh, I mean, I have to assume that, you know, whenever they, there's other stuff going on in the background for the, uh, for the robot arm planning and execution of move, like it, it knows not to try to run the gripper through the point cloud. Uh, and it tries to orient itself so that the gripper, you know, d you know, comes orthogonally into, you know, whatever the, I mean, I, I I'm, I'm guessing there's a lot more planning that's kind of, you know, uh, yeah. not pertinent to the demo that's that's going on there. Yeah, what they say regarding the planning and like robot movement execution, they use something off the shelf. They didn't specify exactly what, but yeah, that that's sort of a solved problem and you can include collision avoidance in that too. And yeah. so essentially what they recover, they recover not just a grass point, but since they recover the whole six degrees of freedom to recover the orientation, how the gripper would hold it, let's say in this particular orientation. And then right. the, the planner solves how to get from any starting point to that point. Right. And, and that, that's just a, a, a quick reminder. We're about halfway through yeah. our time. So I just want to make sure you, you cover the rest of your slides. If Yeah. Uh, you yeah th thanks, Ben. Yeah. So let's, let's just quickly go to, to some of the results. So, so 
um, so they, they compare their method uh, against an, another method, which is cited down here, called dense object nets. Th that's another thing where they where the authors uh, sort of do very similar tasks, like take an object specifying where to pick it up and then pick it up at that location. But they do it differently. They do it from multiple views, camera views. They construct a, a, a three D. Uh, a, a 3D object of the a 3D um, mesh of the object and a 3D um, yeah a 3D dense representation of the object and and then based relative to that 3D model they can cross the object in a specific location so th they essentially show that their approach here is works much better because of all the rotation invariants built in works much better if you change to an arbitrary pose. And you see here, first there may be sort of, maybe, yeah, the other approach cannot handle the bow, but in some cases it's sort of works similar. And, but then their, their approach is vastly superior if you put in an arbitrary pose. Um, yeah, another comment about the results here, they, they also demonstrate this in the robot, as you see in the video in the beginning, but they didn't mention the quantitative results of the robotic system setup. And so, so I suspect if it would be anywhere close to that, they would probably would have mentioned it. And, and so it's probably very low. And, and and from experience, I know it's it's easy to much easier to get a video, a nice video going, than getting the system really reliable. And so it's maybe at the ten percent, twenty percent works. And so it's pretty maybe pretty low success rate. So because yeah, in the real system, you get noise on the point cloud and all the issues, and the execution not always happens exactly the way you calculated it. Um, yeah, so there's some more issues in there. So, so to summarize, um, I, I think the useful concepts in there is, is here, the, the, this particular idea of this rotation invariant local shape descriptors, which effectively we can recover like the 3D pose of an object. And so, so it could be one way, right? And maybe we could have multiple laws to recover more of an object um, it and it works with some amount of deformation of the 3d shape and i think responsible for that is that they instead of like having it this local uh, grass point relative to the all the other points on the object so they they, they don't take the r uh, uh, sorry they don't take the p of the point cloud and combine it with the x location of that point in space and combined with a vector um, uh, neural network, right? In, instead, they combine it with this latent representation. And the latent representation gives you some um, flexibility regarding the kind of deformations you would still recognize. Th though it would be interesting to see what is really the limits there regarding the deformation. I, I suspect with a relatively small amount of deformation, it's okay, like different cups, they all sort of still look very similar. But like some of the things we discussed, like a t-shirt can look totally different, or like the Dali clocks, uh, it will probably fail in such a case. Um, also, I think it's interesting in terms of, that that's a fairly interesting demonstration of the robot. You, you pick up a cup in a never seen before orientation and then you hang it on that hanger. And so if you think about how we demonstrate our system, it should be something that's um, more impressive. And it could be two way, either the whole video looks more impressive or, or it's something we can have it um, instead of one demonstration, instead of 10 demonstrations like they required, we just need one, right? Or, um, or it's just much more reliable. It's not like the 10% success rate or whatever they have. By the way, when they, they needed 10 demonstrations for the pickup pose, essentially you get multiple different instances of those uh, um, local transformation matrices 
rotation and translation matrices. And, and they had to have repeat this multiple times on average across those 10 trials to get something reliable. Um, and yeah, and, and when they used only one demonstration, the success rate in, in simulation uh, just dropped by, by half, like from 88 to 44%, something like that. Also, I suspect they need to know the object ID they deal with. Um, although the, the, I'm not 100% sure about it, if the vector network, yeah, I need to check how they actually trained the net vector network in there. Because they, they leverage this, this other network in there, which maps onto the latent space. And this is, was trained through across multiple objects. But I'm not sure if they, they trained on a per object specific because case this this mapping on the capital five remember they have this occupancy map they need to train with a net vector network and that, that depends on a specific post right a specific post you train to recover it and so uh, was this done on object specific case is not so uh, clear to me um and then yeah as, as i mentioned the success rate on real robots is probably still low so i'm sorry for going over time 10.44. Maybe, maybe any, any follow-up questions we can discuss offline or you just send me a question. And, and let's now jump into the vector neurons, which is a, also a very neat concept to get. Uh, working with the point clouds, how do we represent the point cloud in some rotation invariant way? Yeah, I thought that, was, that one is really interesting too. Yeah. Are you ready, Karen? Yeah, I'm gonna share now. Yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, so this is the paper that uh, I'm gonna talk about. Um, they introduced this idea of vector neurons. This paper was published at um, ICCV last year and was one of the top papers there. It got an oral presentation. So um, what is the paper about? Um, so they're constructing representations from their inputs that that uh, reflect the, the pose of the object and also um, satisfy some interesting interesting properties, um, such as mainly equivariance, which they talk about, um, which I'll get into. So and just just like in uh, in, in the paper Hypo talked about, they have uh, they have these point clouds and that's what they're they're working with and constructing these uh, representations that you know as you rotate the object in a certain way. Um, the representations will also reflect that that rotation. So there's a lot of inter interpretability there too. Okay, so first I think it's um, it's worth going over some of these concepts uh, that which are very crucial to the paper. The first is invariance. Um, so function f is invariance to transformation r. If you know if you apply that trans if you apply that transformation prior to applying f or after, it doesn't matter. You still get the same result. Or sorry, wait. No, that would be no R in this. I think I think I think I have them flipped here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have them flipped. But the um, yeah, the first I is no R. Doing that. So uh, invariance. So, so these definitions should actually be flipped. But otherwise, <laughs> I think this idea of the, the cat being translated and you still getting a cat that I that that's still that's still true for invariance. So I have that flipped. That that's my bad. Okay. So so in invariance, we actually want this where you know regardless of this transformation that you apply, you still get the same output regardless. Um, yeah. And, and that's good for something like a cl classifier layer, where regardless of how the object is oriented, you want that you still want it to I, give it give the same output. And you want um, equivariance. Uh, and, and equivariance is when, regardless of whether you apply the transformation before or after applying f, um, you 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 still get the same result. Okay, so we're used to working with scalar neurons in neural networks today. So um, a, a hidden layer would look like you know you have these these z values. Um, and you just have a vector of them. And so they're all, they're all, there's just a list of scalars that you have. Um, whereas vector neurons, what the others propose is instead of having a single scalar for each, um, for each unit, you replace it with a 3D vector. So now we go from Z, which is just a real number to a three, uh, to a three dimensional real number, through a three dimensional vector V. So this is diagrammatically what it would look like. And so you get this, um, you get this, now you have your, your latent state is this uh, matrix of the number of uh, the number of entries that you have there, which is C times three, because each of them are three dimensional. I should note though that 
um, just because it's 3D doesn't mean that it's representing an XYZ location. Uh, it's 3D because we want we want these to be um, in equivariant to uh, 3D rotations in a in a in a in a latent space. So it's so 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 nowhere do the authors mention that the, that the three dimensions here are representing X Y Z. Although that that's the case with the input. So it's still um, it's it, you you don't necessarily you're not getting an X Y Z value at each layer uh, of of these vector neurons. So, um, so now the authors uh, constructed a bunch of different um, type of layers in the network. So, you know, you have you have linear layers, you have nonlinearities, um, batch normalization, pooling, all that. And they talk about how they how they are constructing these layers specifically for vector neurons, such that it satisfies uh, rotation equivariance if you rotate it around the origin in that space. So, first is a linear layer. This one was um, quite straightforward. So, you just define it as a simple uh, matrix multiply. So, uh, and so in this case, V is the input. That, that's the input matrix here, and, you're, and you multiply it by a weight matrix W, which you which is learned in this case, and that's going to be rotation um, equivariant. So, and then we can just show that here, where you know if you have if you have a rotation matrix R, uh, which is a three by three matrix, and you apply that to to your input V, then um, you know just through properties of matrix multiplication, you get you get back you can show the rotation equivariant property here. So this was um, this is this, this is how their feedforward layers work. Now, note that you can't have a bias here because it won't work if you have a bias. So it has to be just a single um, linear transformation. Next, they have a nonlinearity. So you want, um, you, in addition to having just uh, linear linear layers, you also want to be able to apply a nonlinearity. And they specifically focus on a ReLU type of nonlinearity here. Uh, so for so. So remember, V is this um, is this uh, C by three uh, matrix, and so each of so V you can think of it as basically being a list of these three dimensional vectors, which is given by small V here. Now, how do you apply a nonlinearity to that, which also satisfies rotation equivariance? So how they do it is um, they're computing. So, they're so I mean, this all this stuff here is pretty loaded, but I think. Uh, if you look at the diagram, it's a lot easier. So they're computing these two. So for each, each basically each column in this in this matrix in this matrix V. So each for each three-dimensional vector, they're computing um, they're computing a, a separate um, these two these two vectors, which they call a direction vector K and a feature vector Q. And then um, they both and these are both 3D vectors in a, in a 3D space. And basically, what they do is they apply. Uh, they're 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 uh, I guess higher dimensional version of ReLU is uh, taking um, Q to be the output if uh, it's in the same half space as K. So that means like the angle between Q and K is less than 90 degrees, then you take that as the output. But otherwise, if it's not in the same half space, uh, then you would just project Q onto the plane that K defines. So K is a, K is a uh, three-dimensional vector, which means it defines a, a 2D plane in three-dimensional space. And you would just take that to be your, um, you would take that to be the output of the nonlinearity here. So, um, so this is the equivalent of, you know, of the, of the input to the ReLU being less than zero. You just, you just ignore the actual value and you, you, you take zero here. You're just project, projecting it onto this plane. Now it is, I did find it a bit arbitrary that they're, they're, Doing it this way, that they're picking this k and the q, but they did mention in the appendix that um, sometimes instead of having this q, which which is a linear transformation of the input, they can just use the input small v itself. So, and and the reason why they have this direction k, and as opposed to just picking, um, a pick, as opposed to picking the the unit vector along the z-axis as their as their direction vector, is because they, um, they want it, they want this k to uh, change as the pose of the input changes. So you're not all so so this sort of threshold is changing as the as the pose of the of the object is changing as well. So they want it to be dynamic in, in that regard. And it's key to equi to the equivariance property. Yeah. They need to have it adapting with the rotation. Yeah. yeah. A quick, quick question. Uh, you said they're projected in the plane as opposed to reflecting in the plane. What what, what so would reflecting be um, this this uh, this Q going outwards like this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, it, yeah, they're projecting it onto the plane. It's not. Um, yeah. It's not. It's not reflected. It's like a ReLU, right? Whenever you are in the negative, you go to zero, 
But in this case, there's some other components in other dimensions, right? Which we don't want to also set to zero because then you have a very awkward jump once you go through the plane. That's why they project it. Okay. So this is also a rotation equivariant. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't bother to show the, the proof of it here. I took their word for it. And um, finally, we have an invariant layer. So this would be good for, um, you know, towards the end of the network. If you, if you have a classifier layer, you'd want it to be invariant to whatever the, um, to whatever pose you have. And so here, uh, uh, how they achieve um, invariance in a layer, I found this to be uh, a bit strange how they did it was um, they have, uh, so, so, so basically they define their invariant function like this. So again, it's just a, it's just a single matrix multiplication where you, your, your matrix V, which is the input to the layer is uh, multiplied by a matrix T, which is a three by three matrix. Um, but you want it to, to, in order to satisfy invariance, um, they actually, the way they can do this is that they make uh, the matrix, they get the matrix T, they derive this as the output of an, of an MLP. And that MLP is, um, is just a linear layer, which I talked about two slides earlier. So that is equivariant, which means that T is equivariant here. Um, and, and the input to that MLP is they're regressing um, V along with something else. Um, on to, actually, I don't even know what, I don't recall exactly what the target here is. It, it, was, it seemed very, very, um, in some sense, very hackish. But they do, but they do end up with this matrix T, which is um, which satisfies rotation equivariance, and so what you get then is what you get there then is, um, or I think this should say rotation invariance here, not rotation equivariance. Then what you get is if you have um, a if you have V rotated and that's your input, then um, that means that T, which is the output also from some regression which had V as the input, this will also be rotated because this this guy satisfies the equivariance property then um, you just get the rotation matrix multi multiplied by its transpose. And since the rotation matrix, the 3D rotation matrix is orthon orthonormal, multiplying it by its transpose will just give you the identity. So you end up getting um, just the, the same output as you had before. So this is, this is just showing that it's rotation invariant. So is this, this MLP is a learned MLP? Yeah. Uh, so can we think of this as sort of like the decoder part of an autoencoder? It's just sort of learning to Flip it. I mean, each of these vector neurons has an implicit direction, right? That you showed this, uh, I forget what they call it, K vector or P vector. Yeah, okay. okay, so it's sort of learning the opposite of that in some sense. Can we think of it that way or? You said it's the decoder, right? But um, but but the thing is T here, which-, which Yeah, because is... it's trying to do R, trying to learn this R transpose or no. Um, no, sorry, it, it's, if if you if you could, without that nonlinearity in between, this is very easy to do, right? Is you just it's a linear mapping, and you do the inverse mapping, and you're back to the original vector, right? So the only reason this is difficult is because they have that nonlinearity in the middle. So this is kind of undoing that nonlinearity. Um. I don't, I don't know that you can because you right when, right when I don't you, think you, you can climb. fully yeah because it's not it's not um, it's, it's going not, to a low dimensional space yeah yeah so, so I don't think you can fully but it's it's th that's sort of what it's trying to do um, you're saying the the regression here is trying to do that, that yeah I mean without the nonlinearity this is the the invariance is trivial All right. Right, it's only the nonlinearity that's making this a hard problem. Right, because if you have a linear transformation, mm -hmm. you can just do the inverse of that linear transformation and you're back to where you started. Um, do they use a regular MLP? What MLP do they use? They say it's, a, it's a vector neuron MLP. So it's just, it's just the linear layer that I showed you a few slides ago, their, their linear layer. Oh, oh, this is actually a specific MLP, right? This well, I mean, it's just, it's it's just a just a regular linear transformation, but it's applied to their vector neurons. So oh, the so, output so. of the vector neurons goes into that MLP. Yeah, I mean the, the vector neuron, um, whatever is the input to to this invariant layer goes into this MLP, and then that and that computes, and then I mean you you learn these weights through this, 
and then that is used that is applied again to um, v. Okay, so different. So it's trying to learn what transformation would undo that. No, I, 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 I think it's by construction equivariant, whatever this thing MLP is doing, because they use their own version of the MLP based on their basic units, which are equivariant. So it's not a not a regular MLP. And yeah, but they're trying to be invariant. Some... They're trying to be invariant here. Yeah, not the invariant. So they they get something that's equivariant, meaning that it, it would rotate the same way as your input vector, right? Imagine these are the two vectors, right? This input is the output of the MLP, and so you just guarantee it's equivariant and they rotate the same way. But then you yeah. want to have something that's invariant. So essentially you do the vector multiplication angle between the two. This is what you see down there. It's like a vector multiplication. If it, if it would be just one vector. Okay. okay. And, and then so you essentially get the vector between the two and that's your rotation invariance. Does it make sense? Does, is that correct, Karen? I'm not sure if that's how they're doing it. All I all I saw it as some way to obtain a matrix T that is rotation equivariant. And so mm -hmm. I thought this is just this is possibly just one way to do it. You just need this guy to be rotation equivariant. Once you have that, then this layer, the way they've set it up, will be rotation invariant. But I'm I'm not sure about the the undoing argument that that Subutin said. Well, that's a, that's almost by definition true. Because otherwise, it's very easy to do this to get the rotation invariance. Could it could it be that um, you're starting out with this one dimensional, uh, this particularly dimension space, and are you maybe projecting to a lower dimensional space, and in that space? The rotations are, are kind of removed, and you so you still get the same output, but you're it's not necessarily you're not necessarily recovering the same dimensionality as you started with, but you're getting a result that is uh, is invariant. Are you talking about the output of this layer? Yeah, well, this this operation that 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 we're that you're trying to do when you're saying you know I, I'm I'm trying to. Uh, I'm trying to understand uh, what could be preserved past a ReLU that relates to invariance, and um, it's I'm having a hard time, you know, grasp. I mean, I'm I, I I don't want to I don't want to go down the same path Subutai did, and saying we're trying to exactly undo it because I don't think that's possible because you're losing information through the ReLU. But I'm just wondering if it's looking for some kind of output that is invariant to the rotation that is useful, but it's not necessarily as dimensioned as the original input is, is what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to understand whether that's yeah, Kevin, I think, I think if you just look at one vector neuron, you can't undo the nonlinearity, but if you look at the whole set of them, you might be able to undo it. Yeah. If you look at the whole set, then I think, which what, is what uh, this is doing. Yeah. Uh, what uh, Heiko was saying was that uh, some of those things are not will not be experiencing damage, and then if you do a vector right. product, you recover local coordinate systems from them. So, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah so I guess I, the just, other, yeah. So sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I just had a quick glance at the paper. I, I think they have their specific what they call VN vector neuron MLP. So this is designed to be equivariant, rotation equivariant. Which part is? Like like your purple box? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is supposed to be rotation equivariant. Yeah. And, and that's and they need that in order to achieve rotation invariance in this layer. The yeah, way yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Once it's equivariant, yeah. So you have sort of like two you get the input vector, you get the equivariant output, meaning it would rotate the same way. Um and then you want to get some measure like the vector product between the two, which is then invariant. Okay, I think um, we should move on. So um, there are a couple of data sets that, um, that, they've, that they worked with. I thought it would be um, worth looking at them. So one is um, Sh ShapeNet. Um, these were, these were uh, new to me. I didn't know about these data sets before, but here you, know, you have these 
I guess point clouds are different objects. And you can see here on this um, thing that drops down that they're giving you all these different 3D coordinates of the, the different the different parts. So they worked with this one. And then also um, this other one, uh, this is model net, even though it says shape nets, I believe, because th that is what I searched for. And so again, it's um, point clouds of objects. Um, these might be something we want to eventually uh, consider. Yeah, I think these are good ones. Yeah. Also, I think they're nice from the angle of having some kind of comparison. For example, on the model at 40, there's a lot of published work mm -hmm. showing some recognition performance. And so if you want to convince ourselves that ours is better or does work, that's one thing to test it on and compare against others. Yeah. Um, one of the tasks they showed uh, the model performance is uh, on classification. Uh, and particularly when the objects are um, modified in some way. So um, they, have, they have three different setups here. One where you know, you have, you've, ro you've rotated the object um, during training and test time around the z-axis and, and you're trying to classify, identify it. So from, dif from, from different viewpoints. Um, this one, uh, setup B here, I thought this was the more interesting one where when you're training it, it's only rotated around the z-axis. But when you're testing it, it's any um, 3D rotation applied to it. So that's significantly harder right now because now you're actually viewing it from, um, um, from, from viewpoints that you did not observe during training. And then the last one is um, you've seen a bunch of rotations during training and during testing. So in this, um, in this um, chart that they showed in the, in, in the paper, um, B, the column B, which they highlighted, is, uh, is the, is, is the most challenging one, and you can see that like most models here, uh, they're doing worse on on this on this middle task than they are on the other ones, where they're actually seeing what um, at, the same stuff during training. They're they're seeing a bunch of different types of viewpoints during training and testing, and so their model here I highlighted in um, red. They actually did the best on um, the scenario B, which is your your viewing it from significantly fewer viewpoints during training than testing. They seem to have gotten the best score, although um, it seems like these models down here um, got pretty close. So, so they, they were able to do pretty well on that. And then there's reconstruction. Um, I think there, there are a lot of details here, which I didn't um, fully grasp because I just glossed over it. But um, here what they did is, they, again, they had, they had three different scenarios where they're training uh, with training and testing where there are no rotations applied. And then B is the harder scenario where you're training with, with no rotations, but then you're supposed to identify it from any, any 3D rotation applied to the object. And then the last one is um, same as before. So I suspect how they're doing this is that, um, you know, the, the encoder part, so, so if they have an encoder and a, and a, and a, and a decoder, um, and that's how they're, what they're using for reconstruction. And, and these are using their vector neurons. So the encoder is entirely rotation equivariant, and that's just probably because they're, they're using those equi rotation equivariant layers throughout. And so um, once you get a latent code, you can, actually, um, uh, you can actually apply the transformation to that, and then the decoder should be able to reconstruct something in the pose that you want. And it should reflect that rotation that you've applied to the latent code. So, um, but I think there, there might be some details here that I'm missing. So I don't, so I don't want to talk about this too much, but they, they, did, show, um, they did show visual results here um, where, so, so the, the mustard colored reconstructions are theirs and the, and the, the, the white ones are this baseline method, um, OCNET. And what they showed was that in case A where there are no rotations and you're just looking at it from a single viewpoint, this, this method actually, um, does a lot better than theirs. Uh, and they, they, they made a note of this, that um, it's able to reconstruct pretty well because that's exactly what it's- It's a little bit better than theirs. It's yeah, it's a, little, a little bit better. Um, uh, and it does pretty well. But then as soon as you, as soon as you start applying rotations to uh, objects, this other method totally, um, totally deteriorates and it can't really generate objects anymore. Like this doesn't even look like a car anymore, right? At this point. Whereas their, their method um, actually works pretty, uh, works pretty well with these rotations and it's still able to um, identify or still able, to, still able to reconstruct these objects from these different um, rotations. Yeah, I thought this was really nice results. Yeah. yeah. It really shows that the latent representation is capturing both right. the rotation and the, and the identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also found that the table three on the same page as this one nice because it's just comparing the two different networks, right? Making it 
with the vector neurons and, and the, the other corresponding network from the literature. And it, it totally drops in terms of performance or classification accuracy in the B case here. And that's just where they essentially have almost no drop in performance. Yeah. Can you, can you go back to the, the slide before? Here. Uh, with the table? Yeah. Sorry, this is classification, by the way. Oh, yeah. Ask. Yeah, I was just wondering. It's interesting that from A to B, they have zero performance change. So it is exactly the same performance between condition A and B. But then if you train on 3D rotation, they get better, I guess. It's, it's just strange that there's no change in performance between A and B for them. Yeah, that, that makes sense because of it's it's strictly invariant. But then why would it get better and see? Um, I think that's just a coincidence. In another experiment they did, that's table three, it actually got worse in C. So I wouldn't read too much into that difference. It's just because it's a different training set. Ah, okay. You expect okay. a slightly different result. Okay, so um, some shortcomings that they identified themselves in the paper were that um, you know the modules are um, equivariant to rotations right now, uh, which is great because you're identifying things from different viewpoints, um, but not to any arbitrary affine transformation. Um, so, but you know, but but I found that like you know if if you can look at it from different rotations, that's that's still pretty good. Um, so I guess what they're what they're when when they, when they when they talk about affine transformations, it might be you know zooming out versus zooming in, or can you can you still uh, can you still identify the object, um, even regardless of rotation, also if you're translating it around? And then um, the second thing is, um, um, like mentioned here, right? the re reconstructions um, aren't as good as the baseline mm -hmm. re reconstructions in this case. I mean, it's a little, it's a little bit, the baseline is a little bit better. So I wouldn't, uh, I didn't take that, I didn't worry too much about that one, but I guess, it, I guess this airplane here is a bit better than this one, uh, but, 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 they, but the, I guess, since, since they are able to deal with these other scenarios, B and C, it's still uh, pretty good. Yeah, it looks like, it seems like they lose a little bit of details, which may be because there's no, there's no bias, right? In the, in the, they, they had to remove some elements that, from that the curriculum. Be, yeah. so. is, is the case for both of these papers that they're, they're basically looking at an orthographic camera. In other words, there's no, uh, there's no significant perspective distortion. No, these are 3D point clouds, so there's no projection whatsoever. Oh, okay, right, 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 right. The input is 3D. Yeah. 